the beloved babes were born, came of age, and then were lost in the snow of Munich. Mancuni and Roger Byrne, one of the few survivors from 52, was appointed captain of the new side. Tommy Taylor, who came from Barnsley, but most of the new players, David Pegg, Mark Jones, Bobby Charlton and Dennis Violet, had come up through the United youth team. One player, though, stood above all others from that all-conquering youth side. His name was Duncan Edwards. A shy boy but a footballing prodigy, he began playing for England schoolboys aged 13. Busby had little convincing to do to get Edwards to join the youth revolution at Manchester United. It was the team he had supported as a boy. For those who saw him play, there has been no other player quite like Duncan Edwards. He would grow into an imposing man, both in physical presence and in his charisma on the pitch. He never lost his boyish enthusiasm for the game. Teammate and a fellow graduate from that team, Bobby Charlton, described Duncan Edwards as the best player I've ever seen, the best footballer I've ever played with for United or England, and the only player who ever made me feel inferior. Duncan Edwards made his league debut for United at left half, aged 16 and a half, in 1953 against Cardiff City. He was the youngest ever footballer to play in the first division. Brilliant though Duncan Edwards was, United was certainly not a one-man team. There was Liam Whelan, nicknamed Billy. He would finish his brief United career with 52 goals in just 96 appearances, an extraordinary return for a midfielder. Eddie Coleman was Salford through and through. He was every Stretford Enders fantasy. Nicknamed Snake Hits for his body swerve, he played in midfield with an uninhibited enthusiasm that made him the hero of the terraces. Bill Folkes was the loner. The ex-miner from St Helens was never comfortable with the dressing room banter and glib comments of teammates. But at centre-half, he was a mighty presence, obstinately snuffing out threats on goal. This was a team drawn from all over the British Isles, this was a close family. Pool. And here at Old Trafford, it's Manchester United in the dark shirts, kicking off in the match that should decide the league championship. Five minutes gone, Manchester United losing 1-0 on a free kick. Up it comes. And there's... Vivian. Their style is purest Busby, displaying all the qualities he most admired. Roger Byrne and Duncan Edwards, powerful, courageous, ruthless. Eddie Coleman and David Pegg, inventive and expansive. Dennis Violet, clever and elusive. Tommy Taylor and Mark Jones, never backing down from a challenge. United now down to ten men. Tommy Taylor having gone off, to put Duncan Edwards up at centre forward. Throwing everything on the attack. And there's Berry, getting them going. Berry number seven with the ball. Still United on the attack. And there's great chance there for Violet. There's Roger Byrne to take the pen. And it's Berry. Berry took the penalty. And that makes the score 1-1. Across to Berry it comes on the right wing. Back will defence. Trying the offside game. It's Berry going through with it by himself. Across it comes and Farms made a perfect hit. The average age of the side was 22. Achieving this much so quickly surprised even Busby himself. Once more reaching the quarter-finals, they met Red Star Belgrade. United won the first leg 2-1 in Manchester, and in the return match the result was also close. However, first-half goals from Dennis Violet and then two from Bobby Charlton gave United a comfortable cushion before half-time. But two minutes into the second half, Red Star scored. Eight minutes later, they scored again from the penalty spot. Before the end, a deflected free kick made the score 5-4. Somehow, United clung on to a narrow victory. A 
at Munich Airport on a stopover on the way home from Belgrade, a British photojournalist trying to fill the time finished off his reel of film. It would be the final record of the 1958 Busby Babes. Here is the news. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. Of the crew of six and 38 passengers on board, including a baby, these are the people so far known to have survived. Matt Busby, manager, and the following players. Greg, Wood, Folks, J. Blancheflower, Morgans, Berry, Charlton, Violet, and Scanlon. The explanation for the crash was that a heavy weight of ice on the wings together with thick slush on the runway meant the plane never really made it off the ground and hit an empty house at the end of the runway after the failed takeoff. The initial casualty list was shocking. Duncan Edwards injured, Bill Fuchs injured. Mark Jones killed. Ray Wood injured. Eddie Coleman killed, David Pegg killed, Dennis Violet injured, Tommy Taylor killed, Roger Byrne killed, Bill Whelan killed, John Barry injured. Matt Busby had survived, but was just hanging on to life. Walter Crickmer, the club secretary, was dead, as was first team trainer Tom Curry and the coach, Bert Wally. Duncan Edwards had survived the crash but had sustained serious internal injuries. Only his immense physical strength was keeping him alive. It wasn't only Manchester, a nation was in mourning. Football grounds throughout the country flew flags at half-mast and football fans wore tokens of mourning. Players, black armbands. Mourning is nationwide, indeed worldwide, for men who once delighted the crowds. Of the first teamers, Jackie Blanchflower had survived too, but would never play again. Johnny Berry likewise. Bobby Charlton, Dennis Violet and Ray Wood had sustained only minor injuries. This was the final death toll of the Babes. Roger Byrne, 28, the skipper. Jeff Bent, 25. Mark Jones, 24. Eddie Coleman, 21. David Pegg, 22. Tommy Taylor, 26. Liam Whelan, 22. Duncan Edwards, 21. The Talisman. The mighty Edwards, after two weeks fighting for his life, had finally succumbed to his injuries, whose final words were, what time's kick off on Saturday? The player who England manager Walter Winterbottom called the spirit of English football was now only a vivid memory. The pinpoint 50-yard crossfield passes, the brave tackles, the brilliant goals. The most complete player of his generation would prove an impossible act to follow. It was like a tank when England in trouble in defence. In Dudley, his hometown, in St Francis Church, there is now a lasting memorial. Jimmy Murphy, the assistant manager, who by lucky chance wasn't on the plane in Munich, said he used to laugh when Muhammad Ali called himself the greatest. I've seen the greatest, he said, and his name was Duncan Edwards. The bodies of the dead were returned home from Germany with solemn dignity and the sad round of funerals began with the skipper's Roger Byrne. Manchester born and bred, Busby had thought him a natural successor to his role of manager. He had died two days short of his 29th birthday. The man Harry Gregg called the nicest fellow ever to walk on God's earth hadn't known that his wife Joy was pregnant with their first child. Roger Jr. was born 38 weeks after the crash. 
Of course, though, there were survivors. Northern Irishman Harry Gregg was one. He had been responsible for pulling both an unconscious Bobby Charlton and Dennis Violet out of the wreckage. He then went back into the burning fuselage to rescue survivors, including a mother and child. Jimmy Murphy escorted Harry Gregg and Bill Folks back to Manchester, where he would make Folks captain for the next game. Incredibly, that game was just two weeks later, in the FA Cup against Sheffield Wednesday. The programme was left blank as United fielded a scratch team made up of reserves and the youth team. Bill Folks shook hands with the Wednesday captain, Albert Quicksall, who himself would soon be a United player, filling one of the gaps left by Munich. Wednesday in the striped shirts kick off. Less than a fortnight after the Munich air crash, the babes are fielding a scratch side for a fifth round FA Cup tie. And apart from Fuchs himself, the only member of the original team is goalie Harry Gregg. But from the start, they look more like champions than a forlorn hope. And the 60,000 crowd at Old Trafford, who came prepared to make all the allowances in the world, can hardly believe their eyes. Scratch team or no, this is straight out of the Busby Mole. And make no mistake about it, Sheffield are fighting as hard as they know how. Now the United forwards are on the attack, and that was nearly it. Brennan takes a corner, and it's in. The attack is on again. Mark Pearson's shot rebounds, but Seamus Brennan's there to land a beauty. 20-year-old Brennan was only included a few hours before the match, his first big game ever, and he scored two goals. Harry Gregg's a tower of strength to his youthful colleagues. Time and again, he turns defence into another opening for attack. 17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. Old Trafford's seen some many great days, but for brilliant triumph over disaster, surely none will ever be as great as this. The distress on the faces of Bill Folks and Harry Gregg after the match speaks of an anguish among men, wondering what victory really meant in a dressing room now full of unfamiliar faces. The resulting United Cup run was, however, a true blessing for the club as a whole. It took minds off the trauma of Munich. If by some miracle they were to win, they'd be honouring the memory of the dead. Matt Busby, who had twice been administered the last rites, was now out of danger but unable to move from the Munich hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking from my bed in the Iser Hospital in Munich, where I have been since the tragic accident of just over a month ago. You will be glad, I'm sure, to know that the remaining players here and myself are now considered out of danger. And this can be attributed to the wonderful treatment and attention given us by Professor Morrow and his wonderful staff who are with you today as guests of the club. Again, it's wonderful to hear that the club have reached the semi-final of the FA Cup. And I enclose my best wishes to everyone. After 10 weeks, Matt Busby says goodbye to the Rex Days uh, Hospital in Munich and to Professor George Maurer, that friendly and brilliant doctor, to whom Matt and his fellow survivors probably owe their lives. After the crash, there had been moments when Matt Busby wondered if he could carry on. As he said in later years, before the crash, I could see 10 years ahead, 10 years at the top with nothing to stop us. I knew there was only one thing to do. I owed it to the memory of those fine young men who perished in Munich. United launched directly into attack. Bobby Charlton took the ball into Benfica territory. It was near the end of an unglamorous first half. No score by either side. The second half got underway. The Busby boys seemed fired with a new enthusiasm and stormed into the attack. George Best was in terrific form. United were proving the better side. Hard-working Best put the ball out to the left where Sadler had been playing like a demon. The return centre was a beauty. Charlton headed it home. United won up. The match was by no means won. 
Benfica pulled off a beauty through Grasa. 90 minutes up and still deadlock. With an extra 30 minutes of play ahead, bumps, bruises and tired muscles ached like they'd never ached before. And so on into the first half of extra time. And what a 15 minutes it was. Waiting to receive was mighty best. He simply walked the ball into the net. What a goal! United in the lead. The Busby Babes were raring to go. They hammered Benfica. Watch this fantastic goal. Then the Babe, Brian Kidd scored after a rebound from a David Sadler header. My oh my, how they cheered Kidd, the birthday boy, for that super header. Even Stepney joined in. But where United finished, not on your life. Bobby Charlton, Bobby the Charlton. Munich survivor, scored the final goal in a 4-1 win. Manchester United had well and truly done it. They were supreme soccer champions of Europe. At last, Matt Busby, the maestro of Manchester United, had groomed a team great enough to beat Europe's best. That was my greatest moment, said Matt Busby afterwards. I had lived for it for a long time. This was the combination of all my ideas, my ambitions, winning the European Cup. David Sadler would say a few years later that it was about Matt, Bobby and Bill in particular. Bobby was drained. So was Matt. The European Cup would prove to be the crowning glory for both Matt Busby and for this legendary team. The names of the young footballers that Matt Busby turned into stars still inspires a sense of wonder and their deeds live on. As the old man once said, with the timeless, magical qualities of legend. <laughs>